Welcome to the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. Welcome to the Prog Talks, an interview series by the Prog Space, where we will be talking to musicians in all corners of the progressive music scene. Welcome everyone who's watching and of course welcome to Matthias Olsson. Uh, I'm very happy to be talking to you, uh, both because you're one of the most interesting musicians out there, but also I find you a very interesting person. And uh, <laughs> so thank you for coming here to talk to me. How are you doing, uh, Matthias? I'm doing very well, thank you. We've had a... Uh, we're. Uh well, you can't really. Well, you could do. You could do it like that. And so we're in the studio right oh. now. Oh we're wow! Like live from the studio. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sitting in the uh, least uh, interesting part of the studio room right now uh. for like clarity and everything. So we've had exactly. a, a great, very experimental and fun day in the studio. So that's been wonderful. What's the What's the thing you've been working on today? Uh, von Andersson Noise System, which is a uh, sort of shoegaze project with uh, Henrik, who's an old friend of mine, who is uh, started on this um, very guitar-y based, really cool project. And uh, it, it's like having, we're having a very loud conversation between old friends, which is oh. a lot of fun. And then we'll end up with recorded songs, pretty much. Well, that sounds interesting. That sounds very interesting. You know, shoegaze is something that I find interesting myself. You so I feel it's come to the front of music more during the last years again. And so yeah. it's interesting to to see more musicians look into that style of music. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that I am a, a connoisseur or a... Uh, a uh, well-educated person in the genre because, I mean, we were playing uh, at that time. I mean, I had the indie pop band Pine Forest Crunch and the whole shoegaze thing was going on like a couple of years before yeah, that. exactly, yeah. Crossed over into the early 90s and everything. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, I think that the way it works is that it's there's so many of those sounds and so many of those ideas that can be translated into other genres of music as well so it's like um so i'm uh, i'm learning uh, <laughs> for every session that we're doing as well of how this is supposed to be yeah i think i think that's uh, that's very right what you're saying about this like translating it into other genres because the reason i sort of became aware of shoegaze was of course because a lot of black metal bands have been sort of playing around with shoegaze elements in their music for the last maybe five or ten years. So it's certainly something that a lot of musicians rediscovered or discovered for the first time. And it's interesting to see what comes out of it. What, what What's going to be the new <laughs> the new shoegaze, so to say? Or yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's really weird because, I mean, what I'm seeing now in Sweden, for instance, is that like there's a, a sort of a... A, a new generation of indie pop bands coming up. Exactly, now, yeah. Which is like who are playing like nineties indies indie music in uh so that's really weird when it's like when you were there the first time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and like my 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 daughter asked me a couple of weeks ago, how was it when Kurt Cobain died? Yeah. And you go like, well, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't a huge fan or anything, anything but it was like a a really big seismic moment of in course, the yeah. uh, event. popular culture. Yeah. yeah. And for her, it's like this mythical event. It's history. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's the same thing in that when I'm in the States and I go into a, uh, uh, there was a moment I was, uh, I went to a liquor store to pick up some beers for a pool party and I was only wearing my swimming trunks. <laughs> uh, and I came in with just my, with a couple of like uh, dollar bills in my hand and I was going to pick up a six pack of beer or whatever. And uh, the woman behind the counter asked me, so how how old are you? I need an ID. And I said, well, I remember John Lennon being shot. Yeah. 
And she went, wait a minute, that thin. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, you can You'll buy. Okay. <laughs> you can <get> <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. Well, I'm go uh, you you have to be one of the most prolific musicians I know of. You know, th there's so many bands, projects, uh, you know, stuff you have recorded in your studio. Do you have like a do you have an idea yourself of how many albums you have released or contributed to at this point? I think it's about uh someone counted And I think it's around 160 or 170. Yeah. So. Uh, and the last couple of years, it's been like an average of maybe uh, 10 to 12 albums per year. Yeah, because you're all you've always been prolific. But I feel like during the last couple of years and like last year, I I started trying to count up like what what the, the stuff that you had put out and i was like you know the, it was the devil staircase it was the pixie ninja album it was the you you contributed to the vesa by the gland album as well right yeah yeah and th then there was a uh, uh, video where you contributed to that album and then of yeah. course all your own stuff like the album you did with tom and then mole some And then yep. you didn't re release anything with Dörskalle or or um, with uh, Nanook of the North last year, did you? But but I don't no. know. I I I I came to like is there like seven, eight, nine releases or uh, for last year? I, th I think last year it was twelve or something. Yeah, Ten so or twelve. So I missed some, and I'm I'm not surprised because uh, you know I try <laughs> to pay attention to what you're doing, but there's so much music, and it's it's. And and all of it is interesting to me, so so I oh, I try to try to keep up with it. Yeah, I, I I was wondering, do you mind if I start at the beginning because you start you started playing music at a very young age? As as I I believe I read somewhere that you moved to Sweden. Your parents moved back to Sweden when you were six or something, and you quite quickly yeah. started playing music. What was that? Yeah. How did, how did your first, you know, introduction to to playing music? What was that? And also, what's your first memories of music? Uh, well, my first memories of music is kind of easy because uh, as I was born in Hong Kong, uh, there was a like this old Chinese man who would come uh, on the weekends with a bike, with a like a freezer cooler thing mm. where you could buy like icicles and stuff and he had like this little glockenspiel so he would come to the apartment buildings and then he'd play a melody on the glockenspiel so ah. all the kids would hear the melody and you'd run down and i always thought that the the glockenspiel was like this amazing sound i loved mm. it and if you're like nice and if you bought an ice cream of him he let you play the glockenspiel for a little while <laughs> So I think it was a Pavlov's dog kind of a thing that you yeah, start selling. Yeah, of course. When yeah. <laughs> so when I hear "thick as a brick," I just it it just like I start drooling immediately. Yeah, you you, you <laughs> want ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, when I we came to Sweden, you have that in school uh, when you're uh, I think when you're nine, you're supposed to. Yeah, you pick learn an, instrument, an instrument, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, oddly enough, I wanted to be a conductor. I thought that seemed to be like a, a a smart move because you could like you decided how the music should be, and you had the cool little sticks and you got to wear a tux, which is amazing. Yeah, and I did. You don't have to carry shit around, you know. I thought that seemed to be like the like, like the ultimate thing, but then it was like then the sticks thing, and then I became and then then I started playing drums. Yeah, and and that was uh. uh And it, it was, I think, it wasn't really like love at first bang or anything. No. Uh, because I always thought other people were so much better, you know. Mm. But I, I just kept at it. Uh, I don't think I was, I don't think I was smart enough to quit, you know. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> I, I do think I understand what you mean. You know, you just, you just stuck at it. You, you yeah. didn't, you didn't overthink it. Maybe I, I don't know because yeah. I, 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 I could sort of. I think we all are prone to that sometimes. That we are, you know, once you start thinking about your place in the world and and uh -huh. how many people, like you say, are better than you at what you do or or whatever, it's very easy to start overthinking it and say, you know, maybe. Uh -huh. 
I'm doing something. Maybe I should do something else. But um, mm. well, I'm glad you didn't because <laughs> <laughs> that brought you here. Yeah. So so um, were your parents play uh, musicians or were they interested in music? No, no, no. I mean, they've always been interested in music, you know, and it's always it's always been around. And it, it's that kind of weird thing where. I don't think my parents have never been like really like interested in the music I've been making because mm. starting out with Inglewood, for instance, the whole progressive rock thing, it was definitely not their kind of music, you know? Yeah. Um, but still they really, they were really supportive with like picking me up with my drums or helping me buy a drum kit and everything like that. So they've, they've been, um, uh, a really, uh, uh, really supportive in a kind of quiet kind of way. Exactly. And, yeah. uh, it, it's interesting because uh, I was talking to my dad about uh, the records I've made and everything. And he, I, he picked up a record and he read on the back of the thing that were like, thanks to uh, our families and friends or whatever. Mm. And he just said like, why do you do that? Yeah. Why do you do that? Because I have nothing to do with this album. You know, I had no part in its creation <laughs> whatsoever. And it's like, no, but it's kind of a nice thing. So no, just don't. Oh, yeah. You don't have to thank me on the album. So that's why I possibly there might be a Molson album that will be dedicated to my dad completely just to mess with him. Just exactly. to make <laughs> 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 too bad yeah yeah thank you so yeah. much for making me into the musician i am and so on yeah <laughs> i wouldn't since, be here without you yeah. exactly since you said that you have to <laughs> you have to follow up on that now yeah, uh, yeah, yeah well definitely. i, I want to uh, jump ahead a little bit then because you were mm -hmm. j just like 17 right when you joined engla god and which is of yeah. course something that still to this day is a, a band that's loved by progressive and symphonic rock fans and so yeah. how was that experience how did you get in touch with those guys and how did the whole engla god band project start but i i mean it started as two pretty much two bands one that came from ekra mm -hmm. which was me thomas and jonas and then the uh guys from vaxon which was toward a new one yeah <laughs> And uh, and we'd had a band, the 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 Ekera guys, me, Jonas, and Thomas. We'd always been in bands together, mm -hmm. and then we uh, and we like slowly slid into this progressive rock thing. Uh, and uh, our our entry drug was Marillion, that clutching clutching at straws album. Ah. And then from there, we were like uh, kind of because this was early nineties, late late eighties, early nineties, yeah. 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 So we were, we felt like we were detectives. We felt like we were kind of like Indiana Jones or something, finding these weird albums. Yeah, ancient relics or, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, which is so stupid because it's like 10 years later after they came out or something. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not a hundred years. Uh, and so what, uh, so we not, started. Uh, it's not that stupid, is it? Because, you know, I don't think in the mainstream music that, you're exposed to to radio and TV and whatever. I, I'm not sure you guys saw Marillion there, right? No, no. But I mean, you had Kaylee. Oh that yeah, was on of the course. Radio. As it was a big hit, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you had. I mean, I find it kind of interesting that. Uh, I mean, you had Invisible Touch and you had mm -hmm. Sledgehammer going on at the same time uh, in the charts and. I mean, even though it wasn't, I mean, you sort of worked your way backwards from there. From that, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's the kind of thing where you, I think we went with Marillion, we we found our way back to Script for a Justice Tear. And, and then we heard Selling England by the Pound and went, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. These guys, you know. And yeah. uh, so, uh, but I mean, it, it was a lot of that. And I think there was a... Uh, I mean, kids today, they have it so easy, you know, they can go online, they'll yeah. find the entire discography. For us, it was uh, it was really a, a journey. And uh, even more so because with uh, Johan and Tord, uh, the, the older guys in Englewood, I mean, they, they were fanatic about this stuff, you know. Mm. So they were, they would like, uh, and they were into the whole 
Swedish prog scene, the early 70s stuff, Chetjör Krig, I think, and uh, Kim Nikais, uh, and then the Norwegian stuff, of course. They were like huge Hust. Yeah, Hust, fans. yeah. 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 Folk and Hust and all those Norwegian 70s bands that nobody. Yeah. And I think, like you said, you know, during that time in the early 90s, it seemed like that progressive music before sort of Anglagor broke through and it seemed like the progressive music and, and the links back to those 70s band were in sort of a lull at, at least with younger fans. But then as you guys came along and you had like Anecdoten and Landberg and, and things showing up, it's the ball slowly started rolling with this, this music becoming, getting its own little sub- you know uh, underground scene or whatever yeah 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 uh but i mean i think that for us it was this kind of uh i think it really helped that there was a scene i mean i think that people today when they think about those like the early 90s like swedish scandinavian bands the fact that you had um eng lagord landberg and anecdoten on the same bill yeah for like five dollars whatever at a really <laughs> shitty little bar somewhere but i mean it, it was a small like community kind of a thing yeah and i think there is i wouldn't say that it was necessarily competition between the bands but there was definitely uh we were real everyone was listening to each other's stuff you know exactly yeah and that and that's also the the thing i think there's like a similarity there which goes with all of the music scene during the early 90s for me i was a i'm i'm born the same year as you i think i'm 1975 yeah so so for me it was like at that time it was like death metal and black metal that was like my big interest you know like tape trading and all that stuff mm -hmm. with bands all over the world and you did feel like you were part of a like a uh community and you had to do a lot of work to find new stuff or find new old stuff, if if that's yeah. the right way to say it. And then when yes. I discovered Prog, it was the same thing, right? You know, it's the same as you dis as you describe um, the two other guys in Englagor mm -hmm. with sort of going crazy trying to dig into this old uh, <laughs> this this not only like the the bands that hit you first, like your Yeses, your Genesis, your Emerson, Lake and Palmers, but also finding all these old weird bands that at that point didn't even, you know, a lot of those albums, I guess, wasn't even re-released or printed no. on CD at that time, right? So, no, no, no. It was all. It was all. I mean, I can't imagine what uh, Johan and Tord's record collections are worth now. Yeah, exactly. Because, uh, and I mean, I know that I have probably, because we went to like Greg Walker's house when we played the first, uh, was it Prog Day? Prog Fest. Yeah. And uh, I, I, and I mean, I was, I was into all of that, but there was like uh, a lot of it. I, I had a very low tolerance for this whole, like when the albums start with a low bass note and yeah. then like there's an Italian <laughs> I see. Yeah, the, the, the yeah. Dram dramatics of it, or uh, yeah, 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 and the the whole. Uh, I mean, and so I I didn't really I didn't dive as deep into it as they did, um, because I mean there, there's probably gems at the bottom, but the amount of crap that you have to listen to yeah. to get there. Yeah, because there's a lot of it out there. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, the good stuff is is amazing, yeah. and the good albums are still amazing. But the I don't know if if prog is worse than any other genre with the amount of nonsense that's going on. But um, there's uh, uh, the, the it's still the good stuff that it, that we found then that I still return to. I mean, like the cathedral stuff. Yeah, I think still holds up i agree with but, you yeah 
but, but, and, but there, uh, there is like a 80 20 rule almost there it's like when you <laughs> like <laughs> you know for every eight albums you listen to it, it that is like maybe it doesn't hit you very well there's like two of them that's that's you're gonna be like wow this is actually something very interesting and unique and 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 yeah but but like yeah. you say you dig through a lot of you dig through a lot of mediocre stuff to find those really really amazing groundbreaking yeah. things yeah yeah so, so yeah, but there's also, I mean, what I love with the thing is that it, there's this, um, I mean, people are in the genre are, are generally fairly ambitious, you know, they want to do this yeah, and they want to do the whole thing with the, with the, with the, with the concept albums and the capes and, and all the <laughs> low bass notes and the Dondi Stagri Mojone. And I mean, the lyrics about fantasy and space or the cosmos or, yeah, all yeah, this. Yeah. With the, with the hobbits and everything. Yeah. And I mean, there's something to, to, uh, I mean, there's something really cool about that as well. It is. Uh, yeah. I mean, the other alternative is to get like tight black jeans. A white T-shirt, a leather jacket, and go one, two, one, two, three, four. Ah! Yeah, 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 exactly. Which is, which is uh, so. I mean, but I think we can have a bit of both. You know, you can have yeah. both the tight jeans and the capes, not at the same time. But <laughs> well, why not? It it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> it sounds interesting. It does, you know. So those early days of Engla Gordon, you guys re- released two albums quite quickly. Uh, yeah, ninety. 90- Two and ninety four, right? For for Hubris and Epilogue. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So, how what were those early days like? I mean, we were uh, the start was really cool. I mean, the thing that is like really special about Engelgård and the, the thing that I think um, made us uh, like good or made us like strong in a way mm-hmm. was that we actually wanted to do it. Yeah. yeah. That we wanted to be a symphonic progressive rock band in the vein of bands like Genesis, Yes, King Crimson, Gentle Giant, mm. and these bands, right? And that's what we wanted to do. I mean, so me as a drummer, I wanted to play drums in that way. Yeah. I mean, hopefully with a personal style, but that was what that was what we were aiming for. It wasn't like I wanted Engelgård to be a fusion band. But in the meanwhile, I'll play this squiggly boom rubbish. No, exactly. Yeah. Like so we were all committed to the idea of the band, which is unusual, mm. right? Because a lot of times you have a guitar player who, yeah, I'll do this now, but I'd rather, I would rather be playing heavy metal or exactly, I'd rather be yeah. doing this. Yeah. Right. And we had nothing of that because we actually, we were all fans of the music and we, and we wanted to be a really good progressive rock band, mm. symphonic progressive. And I think you and that were, by, just by that, yeah. just by that, you have a really good advantage on a lot of other bands. Right? I think I think you're very right in that because when I interview other bands, you often have this like them saying just what you said. You know, the, the guitarist he's like the metal guy in the band, and then you have this the drummer he loves his jazz fusion or whatever, and mm-hmm. you know the vocalist she's more of a pop pop singer and you know so you you can sort of tell that they their heart lies in different areas but with Englogod you say all of your guys hearts were in the same place you wanted to make a yeah. symphonic rock album or or um, a progressive rock album and, yeah. and not only did you want to make a progressive rock album you know correct me if I'm wrong but you also wanted to make it in the way that they would have made it back in the 70s with using the old instruments and the old you know recording in a way that was more similar to how it would have been recorded back then isn't that right yeah 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 uh and i mean it, it was um i mean in some ways i mean it became like a a, a mantra of that it, we're going to do it like in this way yeah and it it was almost like we had a like a to-do list like, mm. well, if we're going to be a band like this, we need the following instruments. So we'd get the Mellotron and we'd get the Hammond organ and we'd get the Mini Moog and we'd do all of these things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I mean, it, in, in one way, it's kind of interesting because by doing that, we were also like painting ourselves into a corner of what kind of music or what kind of band 
we were going to be. Yes, of but course. I mean, that's, I think that what um, uh, what makes what made it work back then was that we said that no, we're going to be doing this. This is what we're doing. Mm. And if you don't want to do this, then you should probably be in another band. Exactly. So we were, I think we were pretty much all on the same page. Uh, then there was like obviously other things within the band that weren't as cool and like easy. But yeah. I mean that's I, I mean it's it, that was like the last millennia. Yeah, like. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you are enjoying this interview, please head over to theprogspace.com for more reviews, articles, pictures and interviews all about progressive music. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. theprogspace.com But then you went on to to do quite I would say quite different music more pop commercial related with Pine Forest Crunch, right? Which you joined yeah. after Englagoid. And you guys became, I would say, popular and you released three albums. Is that is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So how was it going from, you know, this like very, I would say like underground scene and, and to doing this like more, this this pop, poppy music or more? And you also yeah, started I, writing a bit then, didn't you? For, for yeah. Pine Forest Crunch, you, you also wrote some music. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I was uh like uh I think I was with with Pine Forest uh uh I was a bit like the George Harrison but with but with uh, a lot worse songs. <laughs> the quality wasn't as good. <laughs> okay. But but still kind of the George, not Ringo, but more George but okay. without Without so the songwriting, at least you're moving yourself from <laughs> up, from up from Ringo to George, but but uh, so so but, but still what, not yeah still but not was, all all there. Well, well, thinking about how prolific you are as a songwriter today, you know, was was that the first time you started writing your own material when you were in Pine Forest Crunch? Yeah, yeah, and it was but it was just kind of weird and. And just to go back to your question about like doing the the jump between like progressive to pop or whatever, uh, you know, I mean, to me, it's uh, I don't view it as all that different, you know. Mm. Uh, even if people who listen to Hybris and then listen to Cup Noodle Song would say yeah. that it's not the same thing at all, but it's more about like an attitude of uh, of how you approach music, you know. I mean, there was, there was never an idea of making uh, Englagord a, a pop band or Pine Forest Crunch a prog band, you know. No. There was never a push-pull thing happening there whatsoever. And uh, so it's more about finding, I thought that, I mean, for every project I've ever done, and that is till uh, like today, you know, I'm I'm learning all the time. Yeah. And everything I I learned in, in in Englagord, I brought with me into Pine Forest, and then you realize that no, 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 this is a completely different set of rules, and this is yeah. how we're going to do this. And then you you adapt yourself to that. You know, you're, you're and, sort of building your arsenal of of you know music uh, knowledge or or yeah. inspirations and everything, right? Yeah, and I've always uh, always been curious about. I mean. Uh, the way that I learned how to play the guitar uh, was quite simply by looking at people playing the guitar. Yeah. By by sitting behind the drum kit and looking at someone playing the guitar for eight hours. And then when those eight hours are gone, you go, you ask the guy, well, you did this really weird thingy like this. How did yeah. that work? How do you do yeah. that? And people generally will show you. I mean, Thanks. they will help you. Yeah, and that was the same yeah. thing with. Uh, I mean, with when we were recording and stuff, I always wanted to be. I always asked people, you know, how do you do that? Or I'd bring albums to the studio and say, how do they do the? How do they make the sound? You know. Yeah, because and, that, um, that that's sort of the next step on your career or whatever. You know, when you went from being, you know, you started writing your own music with Pine Forest Crunch, and then. You started recording your own music and also recording for others with your studio, right? How did that leap happen for you to start fiddling around with, you know, recording stuff? 
Well, well, the thing was that we we were recording in really big studios at the time with, with Pine Forest. Yeah. And so a, a day in the studio would cost a thousand dollars or a thousand euros, right? And then we'd be in the studio and they would have a minimo, for instance. Mm-hmm. And a minimo at the time cost eight hundred dollars. And then we started thinking, wait a minute, if we bought our own Minimog and we had some kind of device that Mm. we could record the Minimog at home and fiddle with it as much as we wanted and then bring it to the big studio where we can record beautiful drums and beautiful strings and horn sections or whatever. And then that means that the Minimog take will be a one take thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And so we did that. We bought a little recording machine that was very simple and very intuitive. And I started recording on that. And it was uh, 12 channels. And I just, um, and it was also this kind of thing that people always, I've always been kind of taught that like sound music engineering and recording and music in itself is like this super precious, pristine thing Mm -hmm. that, Music is something that um, if you treat it badly, it will break Mm. or it will become sick and die, which isn't true. It doesn't work like that. Uh, You can do a lot of things with music. And uh, the idea of being afraid of music or being afraid of music recording, I mean, there's so many rules that I'd heard, you know, like you can't do this with a guitar or you can't do this with a drum. Um, yeah, which meant that as the first thing I did when I got my own recording equipment was to do exactly that. <laughs> well, okay, so you can't do this. Well, I'm going to try it. Yeah, and it's like, what? Yeah. Well, now I know what that sounds like. You know? Yeah, and and also and you put it in the toolbox. You, yeah, and 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 you sort of find out, you know, you, it's only good things that can come out of that. Either you understand why they told you not to do it, or you're like, well. I did it and this actually has something to it that I've never heard before or yeah yeah and and, and it, it, it's about um and it's about exploration and it's about being curious and and also I think that the uh, it, it's a bit like that whole uh, 10,000 hour rule you know and 10,000 hours I mean that's to be a expert or master I don't know what the term Malcolm yeah. used yeah in, but uh, what, what it's about uh, is 10,000 hours is an awful amount of time if you're not having a good time when you're doing it. But if you're into it and you're having a good time and you're hanging out with your friends and you're going playing, being 17 year old, like playing in Los Angeles Mm. with your band and getting paid for it. Yeah. Well, 10,000 hours isn't all that much anymore. No. You know, it, it doesn't sound bad at all when no. it's 10,000 hours of enjoyment and joy and learning in a positive yeah. manner. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not always it's being not 17 all, in no, Los Angeles. Of course not. It can also but. be 46 in, in a in a very violent <laughs> suburb of Stockholm, which, which I don't mind either. But. No. <laughs> I see. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I just want to, uh, you know, move on to the, you know, I'm, I'm going like quickly back to Englagoid because, mm-hmm. as you mentioned earlier, one of the f- albums you guys listened to and that I feel informed your sound was, of course, uh, Stained Glass Stories by Cathedral. Yes. And in December, you released an album with uh, the now late Tom Doncourt. Uh, called yeah. uh, Tom Doncourt and Matthias Olsson's Cathedral. And uh, yeah. I, I found that, you know, that album, um, it's a beautiful album, and I found the story behind it as far as I've been able to to read about it, very, very touching. So how did you go from that stage of, you know, like sitting, listening to Stained Glass Stories to actually getting to know Tom and recording with him and... Well, I mean, it, uh, that all came about um, a long, long time ago. Uh, there's this place on the internet called MySpace, mm. uh, which uh, was a place where people and bands could meet and hang out. Now it's a very desolate and quiet place. Yeah, Sometimes a- I go there just to be alone. <laughs> and uh <laughs> Yeah, if you if you, if you if you just want peace and quiet, you can go to MySpace for a while and just hang out. Yeah, and uh, I so uh, I found Tom there, 
and then we started talking on there because we we both loved Meltrons and all that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I heard that Cathedral was making a new album, and I thought that was amazing. And I was like, I I would record you guys for free. You should come to Sweden. And and it's like, no, 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 we've already started. And and then I heard the album, and I was very very disappointed with the album. Mm. Because they had used electronic drums on it. Oh yeah. And they had and they had done a lot of they'd taken shortcuts on the album. And I told Tom that I didn't like the album because of this. And that started a discussion. I mean, if you wanna start a discussion with someone who's creative, if you if you go up to them and say, Man, I love your stuff, they generally generally will go, Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um uh, but there's no really, there's no real bounds to that. You can't, no. uh, if someone says, I love your stuff, you can't go, oh, what do you love about it? You know, that's kind of an asshole move. Uh, uh, yeah. But if you say, uh, yeah. uh, I heard the new Cathedral album, uh, it has a lot of, it has so much great music, but what happened with the drum sound? Then you start a conversation. Then you start like bouncing back and forth. Then you have like a start of something. And I I just felt that as I was such a big fan of Cathedral and especially their drummer, who I thought was amazing, um, when they went over to the whole synth electronic drum thing, I felt like they they lost a lot of that energy. And, you know, it it was almost like you you were afraid that something was going to break, you know, all the time. Yeah. That that something's going to crack and and, or, or like catch fire or something. And when I heard the album, it wasn't that anymore. So, and and then me and Tom became friends. And then we started talking about, and then I started drumming on his albums. And then we started talking about like, you know what, we should do an album together, like full on thing. Yeah. And then yeah. it was, uh, and then that big grew into, oh, what is it going to be called? And I was like, it's going to be called Cathedral. And I was like, what? Yeah, it's going to be called Cathedral, our Cathedral, our version of Cathedral's music. And he was like, okay, we can do that. And that was like one of the last messages I, I got from him that, yeah, we're doing it. It's going to be called Cathedral. Oh, really? So, yeah. Yeah. So he agreed with you, uh, like, towards the end of, of of his life, really, that this would uh, be ca- a cathedral. I mean, to clarify, it's our version of it. Yes. You know? I mean, we're not cathedral. No. That was like the tricky thing about the title as well, that we're not saying that this is a new cathedral, cathedral album or no. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. no, because I, w- I would never do that either. I mean, it's like I would start a band and call it Englagord. Yeah. Englagord yeah. is those people in a room doing that. Exactly. Cathedral yeah. was those people in the room doing that. So, and uh, no, but it was really, really, uh, because when we met, um, Tom was a teacher mm. and incredibly generous and one of the most giving people i've ever met i think um so it it was just this um he would we would um he would just show me things yeah and and share so when so so it was so when the when uh, when tom passed had you already written most of the music for the album or or did you have a lot of the music that ended up on the album at that at that point yeah, I would say that probably 80% of the album was done okay, by that yeah. point, idea-wise. And the rest is, I think I wrote that in the booklet as well, It was that we had, he left like blueprints mm. in the material. Um, and there was a lot of times where I felt that it was uh, really hard and really emotional to do the album. Can imagine. Uh, and, but then on the other hand, I felt like, he w- he wasn't the same thing there. He wasn't really uh, careful with music, you know. Mm. He he wanted to uh, he wanted to be alive and and be be explosive and be all over the place. I mean, that was the kind of guy he was. So a, a bit of the same ethos that you talked about just earlier in this interview, you know, be not be afraid to break stuff, but. You know, yeah. go out there and and do whatever you you want yeah. to do. Yeah, and if it's horrible, if you do like a really horrible song or album. You know, when I when I produce bands, you know, 
and they do stuff. And they go, oh, it's so bad. And then I always ask them, is this your last album, you know? Mm. Is this your last album you're going to do? And they're like, no, of course not. And then I go, oh, well, it's probably fine then, you know? <laughs> I right? see. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to do your last album, yeah, maybe we should do another take on that drum film. Maybe it's not that great. Yeah. I would probably want to go out with a really horrible album. <laughs> I, think that, that would be, I think that would be a good one. It's that, that, like that it's really finished. Yeah, Matthias Olson's advice to bands, you know, go out on a terrible note. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. yeah why not? Really? Yeah, 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 but, yeah. But but uh, also after after Tom Posts, you released uh, the Molesome album, Tom and Tiger, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and that album seems to have. Um, like caught a lot of your the emotion and the, it's a very somber album i believe i read you recorded it quickly and without with like a special in a special way to sort of catch a lot of that emotion or those feelings right and it's also um, yeah. related to your daughter right tiger which yes yeah so so was that like a car catharsis album for you something you needed to get off your chest or But I was just, I was just stuck, you know, it was, it was, it was a really horrible period, those mm -hmm. months. And I, being Scandinavian, I guess, you go to work anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. You go to work and it doesn't matter what you, if you actually get anything done, you mm -hmm. go to work. Yeah. So I was mostly walking around the studio, kicking things and crying and, and screaming and and just misbehaving for eight hours a day. And then I'd put my jacket on and I'd go home. Mm. And then the next day I'd go back to the studio and I'd be crying and swearing and kicking things. And I'd be doing that for a couple of weeks. And then one day I sat down at the piano and then I played something. And I felt that, well, this isn't total crap. This is something. I could I could imagine myself listening to this twice. And then I sat down and then I recorded one of the pieces. Mm. And then I went back the next day and then I and I think I did the most of it in probably a week. And I also did it as a kind of dogma thing that it was always it's going to be one take. It's going to be completely improvised. It's going to move in a in, in a certain harmonic mode throughout the whole thing. Mm. And uh, I'm not a big fan of when, 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 like, when people say that, like, well, music is therapy, you know, I, I, I don't think it really doesn't work that way for me at mm -hmm. all. I don't, uh, it, once again, I mean, I've made two albums that I didn't really want to make. I didn't want to make the, you know, the cathedral album by myself. No, of course not. I didn't not. want to finish it like that. Yeah. That wasn't in the plan. I didn't want to make the Tom and Tiger album. If I could have chosen, I wouldn't. But I think that I felt that I had to get that out of the way so I could do other stuff. Mm. I mean, it, it was more—it it was more about like uh, just trying to get it out of my system in a way. I was hoping that I would do like a, um, because it's just like really—it's it, draining to do those. And it's at the end of it, it's not like you feel any release or anything. You've just like, it's like if you feel horrible and then you, you print a t-shirt with it and you wear that as well. I mean, I don't know how that's going to help, you know? No. So it's been just, it's just been pretty awful, you know? And, uh, and the thing about, um, I mean, the cool thing about the, 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 the cathedral album there is the fact that you can hear Tom all over it. Mm. that he's there right and if you want to hang out with him for a while uh he he's in pretty much every note on that thing exactly yeah and that's that's a cool thing that's a wonderful thing uh but then there's like to me i mean the worst thing about everything that happened was the fact that it was a, a conversation that ended yes because he was yeah. he was the kind of person where he was interested in really weird details in things you know And we would have conversations that you didn't have a conversation with him about things that no one else cares about, hmm. you know. And uh, I think both my wife and Tom's wife uh, felt uh, they're not the same wife. 
and felt that it was good that um, that we'd found each other, so they they didn't have to listen to all our crap. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like they, you found you found someone who was actually interested, and he found someone who was interested in those little details that nobody else yeah. cared about, and could have like yeah. a interesting discussion about that. So. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I do understand that because it's like a part of you fall away when once he disappeared, right? Where all of those yeah. thoughts and all of those interesting details that you probably have in your head every day, you I would expect you to think that you know, oh, that is something that I would have loved to discuss with Tom, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's exactly like that. Um, and uh, and you just know that it's. Um, but it's also this other thing about it that if he if he knew that I reacted the way I did and that yeah. I wasn't getting anything done, uh, he he would probably be really upset with me. You know, yeah. he would probably uh, he would slap you on the like, head and if, say, you know, yeah, get get, get on, on with it. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it 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 goes. Um, it's just this weird. But it, it exactly the way you you put it. The fact that you have these. Things happen in your life and you go, oh, I want to tell Tom about this. And mm. then you can't. Yeah. And there is this little, there's this really like tenth of a second where you, where you forget, you know? Yeah, you forget that he's not there and you, you're you yeah. actually kind of excited to share that with uh, with, yeah. with him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to a, a, a bit more lighthearted thing because I promised my mm-hmm some of my colleagues that I would ask you about this. You know, I sometimes see you <laughs> in certain prog groups on Facebook yep. doing a tiny bit of, I would call it a tiny bit of trolling. And I'm now talking about groups that, you know, uh, contain people that are really talking over and over again about albums released maybe 50 years ago. And so yes. I'm just wanna, I just wanted to, to hear your take on, you know, what what do, what's the deal about? What do you find interesting about that? And what's your thoughts on the the current state of progressive music in in twenty twenty one and this? You know, yeah. Uh, give me two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he he decided to split. I, I think I I think I asked him something um, he didn't want to answer. So no 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 no. no. <laughs> Uh, oh, that was Country House with Blurry. Uh, well, uh, yeah, there is a bit of trolling going on, I guess. Uh, well, I just find it interesting. You oh, know? Not, not maybe trolling, but a bit of fun, right? A bit of like uh, yeah, tongue in like cheek. Yeah, like a small. Yeah. yeah. Like a small troll, like an elf. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, the, like a, yeah. Like a troll helper. No, but what I want is what I would like. That I, I'll put it, I'll flip it the other way. I had a month of listening to only new music. Yeah. Last year or two years ago. Every day I'd listen to a new album and I'd listen to it three Mm. or four times. And I wasn't allowed to listen to any old music. And I'd listen to a new album every day for a month. Yeah. Yeah. And what I realized that with the amount of new music, that is amazing that comes out every day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I love those old prog albums. I think they're amazing. But um, the, the, there's this, compl- there's this um, avalanche of this repetition of, yes, Genesis, King Crimson, mm-hmm. all of this, all the time. And then, and then there, it's this idea that, you know, like Pink Floyd is underrated, <laughs> or like what is your top three? Genesis what is your albums, top three yeah. topographic? Yeah, <laughs> top three topographic oceans albums. And then there's this other thing with the bands themselves, where they're milking the audience as well. Yeah, that they're taking advantage of the audience. With releasing these these box sets of whatever, and they're releasing remixes yeah, and live, remasters live from here and live from there. Uh, it's like yeah. five and albums a year with a, a, a different yeah, live and, performance. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's perfectly in a way. I mean, we're all adults. You can choose to buy 
those albums or yeah. not, right? And, but and, those also... people, and those people deserve to make some money off their music as well. That that's also part yeah. of it. But but at the same time, I understand what you're saying completely. Yeah, because I I think that uh, I mean it, it just feels like I think the people prog fans. That's the thing. I think prog fans are amazing because they're super loyal. Yeah, uh, they're generally they always have like well the last album was complete crap. But I'll buy the next one anyway. Yeah, I'm still going to check anyway. this new one out. Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. check it out and see what it is. Yeah. You know, and and that's amazing. And and the people are super nice. That they're, they're like, so like the, when you're on tour and hang out afterwards and everything, it's amazing, wonderful people. Mm. And I also think that when I think that they should be treated better, they deserve yeah. better music. They deserve to be treated in a way that they, they, the band should repay these people and the fans, you the, know? The, yeah, the focus maybe should be a bit different for about this, you know, the, the you know, the re-releases and the... But I guess, you know, there are labels involved here as well with a lot of these older bands and, the, you know, they're pushing out as much content as possible to, you know, to make some make some money, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. The idea for me... And I've said this before, the idea that someone willingly would sit down and listen to the music I've made for 45 minutes yeah. is amazing. That's such a cool thing, you know? I mean, and that's something as an artist you should be incredibly grateful for. Like this stuff, I mean, have you heard my maracas playing? It's pretty <laughs> dismal at times. But still, people live through that stuff. Yeah. And and, and, they, and this, they enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people are weird. What can I say? <laughs> uh, but, you know, and, and and just that. And I I think that's amazing. Because when it comes to all of this rubbish we're going through now and all of that, I've realized there's this, there's this wonderful quote in, in uh, Willy Wonka, Charlie and the uh, Chocolate Factory. And they talk about like there's entire factories where they print money, yeah. that, but they're only five golden tickets, you know? And I view that in, in one way, there's one thing you can never get back. I mean, you can, you can set your Maltrons on fire. There are a couple of more you can get and, mm -hmm. and, and money and all of that and Dr. Martin's or whatever. But if there's one thing you can't get back, it's time. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the fact that someone would want to spend their time with you and the music and the art you make, that's amazing. I agree. And I think that it, it, it makes it, it's such a, a, a beautiful thing. So I'm, I'm just like, I think that's wonderful and something to be, and then to start a conversation from that. It, it's remarkable. Yeah. That's my it, take on it. I, th I think that, yeah, I think that's a, a, such a, a lovely way of, of looking at it. And it's such a generous way of looking at it as well. And so for me, that is, you know, we've been talking for almost an hour. So I think it's a, a, a very nice way to end it on, you know, you know, that thankfulness, huh? that generosity for music and, and, and your appreciation of your fans. But I just want to ask like quickly at the end, you know, you already released some music in 2021, you know, there was a Molson <laughs> album that came out and, you know, what else can we expect? What else? And, and you, of course you, you were, you're working on some, some music just when I <laughs> interrupted you with this yeah. uh, interview. And uh, so what else is in the pipeline with uh, Matthias and the Roth Handel Studios? And All right. I, th that's the funny thing, because when people ask, I generally, generally just draw a blank. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to try. Okay. okay. So there's three yeah. Molson albums. All right. Three, three there's of them. Yes. There's Afton Lan, which is sort of an acoustic ambient thing. Yeah. Which is sort of like Tom and Tiger, but without like, without the, whole, the, yeah, the, the horrible whole, backstory. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We don't need that. And then there's one called Running Out of Change, mm -hmm. which is uh, very cinematic and sounds like Ennio Morricone type. Mm. It, it's like a heist thing. I'm already then excited. There's a, 
And then there's like a normal one that will be yeah. out on 9th of January next year. Okay. Then we have the Fernando Chan Noise System album, the shoegaze thing that I was the talking about that, that we're working on today. You're working yes. on now, yeah. yeah. Which is amazing, which is like uh, we're four tracks in on that. And that is turning out to be pretty spectacular. Mm. It, it's it's Technicolor, Technicolor Shoegaze. And then I'm working on Elisa Montaldo's uh, solo album, okay. the singer and people play from El Tempio del Cacida. Mm-hmm. Then I'm working on Luz Triadas, uh, drumming on their new album, which is a, uh, I think it starts out in Mexico, but I think the guy, the main guy is in Bolivia now. So it's like, I'm going to go wild and say that's a South American proggy project. I see. I then see. I'm drumming on um, uh, the new Isobar album, and they're from California. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. the second one. And then I'm doing the uh, Galasphere, new Galasphere album. Well, there's going to be a new Galasphere album as well. Yes. So there's going to be yes. some space Maybe exploration. Maybe that was a secret. Yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, that could have been, oh yeah. But that was mostly the cover, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah probably, yeah. And and sort of yeah. a little bit with the, the name of the band and stuff, you got some sci-fi yeah. feels about, the, about that album. Uh-huh. At least I did. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm doing a, uh, a Robert Johnson thing, which is completely different, which is like uh, chain gang songs. Oh. And uh, almost like it's super dirty, gospel kind of stuff. And uh, then we're doing the uh, Nacht album, which is kind oh, yeah. of drowsy, I, I, drowsy I listen, stuff. I listened to that track for the first time today, actually, and I really mm-hmm. en- enjoyed that and the concept behind it. So I'm glad to hear you're doing more with that, uh, with Nacht. Yep. Yeah. We do that. And then we're doing my daughter's solo album is going to come out. And then we have the Dörr album that we're two songs away from finishing. And uh, anything more with you know, Nanook? I think that there's probably a band out there who's just waiting for me to say their name, and, <laughs> and course, then they yeah. go, That Swedish asshole who <laughs> forgot us. What about Nanook then, of the okay, North? So anything that, with that? What are you doing anything more with Nanook of the North? No, I'm not right now. Uh, Ulla has a new project called Marble Raft, and they're releasing their first single today. Uh-huh. So we'll be looking into We might be doing something. We have some old songs. But, I mean, I'm really bad at um, going back, you know? Yeah, I see. Yeah. You know, that, that's <laughs> what I, why Kraftwerk, they really like uh, bicycles. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, because they say it's the ultimate man machine. <laughs> Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing they like about bicycles is that they don't go backwards. Ah, a you're right. A bicycle always, you can't pedal you back. Can't back bi- you can't back up. You're right. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh. So they think that the bicycle is the perfect man machine. And so, so I was say, okay, just to like kind of uh, save myself. And then there's a massive amount of secret projects that I can divulge right now i see but there's more <laughs> stuff happening yeah well thank you so much matthias that was o- it was awesome talking to you and uh, and to, to you guys listening and and watching if you enjoy this please like and subscribe because i have to say that and oh. everyone you know get on your bicycles and move forward i, I that yeah. sounds amazing yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right okay and, and the funny thing that as we're on skype uh, we have to give like a, a star review on the conversation. Oh yeah, so you do, can yeah. go first. Yeah, what, yeah. What, what would you give the conversation? Yeah, as as I'm, you know, a, a, a music reviewer as well. I, I I'm I'm quite used to having to do that. I don't mm-hmm. always enjoy it, but but I'll give this a, a five out of five because I think that's the me too rating. That's could, amazing. Yeah, yeah. I think we're in each other's head with this, but yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank, thank you right, so, so much, Matthias. Five Matthias. out of five. Yeah, five out of five for this already. That's great. Take care. Thanks. Stay safe. The Prog Talks, produced by the Prog Space. Main host, Rune Belsvik Reynos. Produced by Rune Belsvik Reynos, Vanessa and Matthias Kirsch. All graphics and animations by Vanessa Kirsch. Intro theme by Giuseppe Negri. 
Outro theme by Zach Munemies. This was the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. See you in a week.